Well, good evening. Glad to see everybody out. A little cool and damp today, so. And the weatherman said it's supposed to be sunny this afternoon. I didn't see it, so. <laughs> so we're a little bit off. We are thankful for everybody out this evening. We invite you to stay right along with us. And we'll try to do things in accordance to God's Word. If you see anything that I'm teaching false, please bring it up to my attention. Because I don't want to uh, cost me my soul at the end. So uh, please be happy to uh, bring it to my attention. I want to talk about two appointments. We all go through appointments in our daily lives. We either have an appointment to have our car uh, checked out and, and repaired at times where we have appointments for doctors or a uh, high appointment or uh, maybe an appointment for a job uh, interview. And we all go through this. And there's times that sometimes you have to cancel those appointments because of the weather or sickness or something on that order. But there are two appointments in accordance to the scriptures that none of us will miss. We will be there for both of them. If you turn to Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 27, the writer there says, as, And as it is appointed to men once to die, but after this the judgment. There are two appointments right there that we'll be facing when, when the time comes. And that's what we're going to discuss this evening, is death and resurrection and the judgment day. And the fact is, those are two subjects a lot of people don't like to talk about. We don't like to talk about death because we, we fear it. We don't want to be prepared for it. When you talk about somebody who wants to sell life insurance, uh, they don't want to discuss it. And uh, when it comes down to it, we need to at times. Death. There's a lot of us, we, we sit back and as this young man sitting in the chair saying, leave the family, home, my position, what about my wealth, my friends, my all? Man is of a few days. In Job the 14th chapter, in verses 1 and 2, man who is born of a woman is of few days full of trouble he comes forth like a flower, fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. A lot of us think that when we get up in our 80s and 90s, we lived, uh, they lived a long time. But as I get older and get closer to those ages, I found out that really, it's not much time. Time is really going fast. I'm 63 years old, and it seems like a couple of days ago, uh, I was still in high school. I can remember those days where yesterday my granddaughter was born, but she's 16 years old now. Time flies. Time goes past. And a lot of us, we get to the point that we, we think, well, we'll be here forever, and especially the young people, they think that they'll reach these ages. It's not always true. As Job was trying to point out, man is like the flower. It's here, then it fades away. It dies off. It don't last long. When you buy flowers for your wife, if you young men uh, do this, uh, or your husbands, you buy flowers for your wife, they sit in the house for maybe two weeks, and that's about it. They're done. That's the way life is. And that's something we got to realize. Again, brought up within the scriptures, that we need to set our house in order. In Isaiah, the 38th chapter, verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And he Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amzon, went to him and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, set your house in order, for ye shall die and not live. 
Now, how many times have we been told to get our house in order? Yeah, have we prepared for the future? I'm not around forever. Have I provided a way for my family to carry on? And not have to struggle so much? Like I say, life insurance? Talk to an agent? And he says, two hardest people to talk to is young people, because they think they're going to live forever. And the older generation, they don't want to talk about it. They hate to think about dying. And they don't prepare. Nowadays, didn't used to be, you could go down and make your own funeral arrangements. How many do that? I know a few, but I don't know very many. Set your house in order. Why? Because you're going to die one day. And you need to prep, prepare for your family to carry on and for others. Death is imminent. Also in 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 24 and 25, talks about our flesh being like grass. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flowers falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. Peter is trying to get man to realize we won't be here forever. We won't be here very long. We be like the grass. It withers. It dies off. The flowers, they die off again, as I brought out before. And that's something that we need to think about. We may live to be 90. We may live to be 80. We may only live to be 16. There are individuals, all type of ages, that will die. And we need to be prepared. James 4th chapter, verses 13 and 14, compares it like a vapor. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a little time, then vanish away. Those who cook, when you see the pot boiling, you see the steam coming up, how long does it last? Not very long. How about the steam in the bathroom if you use the hot water? Everything steams up in there. You, when you get finished, how long does it last? It don't last very long. It's there, then it's gone. That's what our life is. We're here. And we think, like I say, 80, 90 years old, that's a good age. But the closer you get to that age, you realize time really quick. It's really fast. It's not much there. It is a vapor, then it vanishes away. In Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, verses 10 through 11, the writer there is talking about our death. And the fact is, we don't need to worry about our life on this earth to some degree. Whatever my eyes desire, I do not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had made or have done, and on the labor in which I have toiled. Indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There is no profit under the sun. <coughs> Solomon is doing the writing here. He's saying that sometimes we worry about what we leave behind to some degree. We want to make a name for ourselves. We want to leave something that people will remember us by. But Solomon said, yeah, here I am. I worked all these years. I labored. And then I looked back. It's vanity. 
And it is. A lot of times we sit there and we work for things and we find out that it's, it's not worth what we, <laughs> we struggle for. A lot of times we put so much emphasis on physical things that we forget the spiritual things. In Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter, verse 13, Solomon came to a conclusion. He says, Let us hear the, the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is man's all. This is what we're here for, is to keep God's command. We are to be obedient to His will. As long as we do that, we're fine. All the rest is vanity. But yet, sometimes we put that material item over God and His commandments. Luke the sixth or twelfth chapter, and begin at verse sixteen through twenty-one. And He spoke a parable to them, saying, "The ground of a certain of a certain rich man yielded plentifully." And he thought with himself, saying, "What shall I do?" since I have no room to store my crops. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. You know, I almost made the same statement that individual made. <coughs> we bowed a home, prepared it, and I thought, well, I'm working good. We set up for the next 20 years, at least. Won't have to worry about anything. Nothing will be have to be fixed and repaired because everything is new. Well, see what happened. Didn't last long. That's the way life is. And we need to put our treasures up in heaven instead of up here upon this on this earth. Sometimes we. Don't think about the future as we should. We need to prepare our soul for heaven. We need to realize that death is coming and we need to prepare for the other side. There is something that we need to work on within our life as we're here. And that's something that we fail to do sometimes. Matthew the 25th chapter verses 1 through 13 tells us that we need to prepare. We need to prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ again. This is the, about the ten virgins. Most of us know, realize and remember this. Uh, five of them were wise, five were foolish, five of them had enough oil with them, waiting for the, king, the, the groom to come. And the other five, they didn't take enough. They thought they were, oh, if we need it, we can go down and buy some more. So, as they seen they were running out, they asked the five wives for more oil for their lamps. They turned them down, saying, we may not even have enough for ourselves. And as they left to go buy more oil, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready with him went to the wedding. The door was shut. In verse 11 of that chapter, it said, Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, As surely I say unto you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour in which your Son of Man is coming. Are we prepared for heaven? Are we prepared for our death? There's no warning when we're going to die. There's no warning when God is coming, Christ is coming back. Do we realize that? Do we think about that? Sometimes we put the farthest thing from our mind is death. 
and the judgment done. Because we don't want to face it either. But the bad part about it is we're going to face both. And we need to be prepared. And we need to be like those five wise virgins. We need to be ready. Death. Will it be a game? Philippians, the first chapter, and verse 21. For me to live, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul was writing to the church of Philippi. What's he mean by this statement? Well, at that time, Paul was deciding whether or not it's better for him to stay here or to move on and be with Christ forever. He was, be, he was be twixt between the two. He didn't know what to do. He says, it's better for me to be here for you. But for me, i got great gain. I'll be with Christ forever. There's nothing better to prepare for. How is it a gain? Well, think about it. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 22 and 20, 23, you won't have any more sin. Think about it. If I prepare myself to go to heaven, and I've done God's will, and I die, I don't have to worry about sin anymore. I've relieved the pain. Luke 16, chapter, verses 24 and 25. I have profound rest in our souls. Revelation 6, chapter, verses 9 through 11. Knowing that Christ has prepared a place for us. We have rest in our souls. And just think about it. We'll be with Christ forever. What's there to lose? What are you losing in death if we've been prepared? If we've done God's will as we should? Matter of fact, we haven't lost anything. We gained. And we need to realize that. Are you ready? 2 Timothy 4, chapter, verses 6 through 8. Paul wrote to the young man Timothy and says, For I have already been being poured out as, as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give, me, give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also all who have loved his appearing. Can we make that statement? Paul say he's ready. I'm ready to die. I'm ready to move on. I'm ready to face what's next. Can we truly say that? Can we make that same statement that Paul made here? We need to be able to. We need to realize the condition we're in and if we're prepared for what's next. Are you faithful? Revelation, the second chapter, verse, chapter 2 and verse 10. Do you not fear any of these things which you're about to suffer? Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you to prison, that you may be tested at tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Can we say that? Can we truly say that we've been faithful all our life, and we're ready to receive the crown of life. That we're ready to receive heaven as our home. Have we done the will of God as we should? Yes, we're going to suffer. And we're going to suffer a great deal on this earth. We're going to go through a lot of pain, agony. We're going to face a lot of temptations. There are going to be people that ridicule you for what you believe and stand for. But at the same time, if we remain faithful, we receive heaven as our home. Now, the second appointment is judgment. Revelation, the 20th chapter, verses 11 through 15. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. 
Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, and whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, every one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. How can you deny that there's not going to be a judgment? Hebrews 9.27 said there is. Revelation 20 said there is. We need to understand there is going to be a judgment day. And there is going to be a resurrection. In John the 5th chapter verses 28 and 29 do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection and condemnation. 1 Corinthians 15 chapter, you can study this if you go home. Verses 35 through 50 <coughs> describes resurrection. What's going to take place? And we need to be prepared for that. We know it is coming. We know that Christ was resurrected on the third day. And not only when Christ died, He also proved that individuals could be resurrected from the dead because people came out of the grave as Christ gave up His soul. Resurrection. They walked around the city. Many people saw them. There is a resurrection. Another thing, we're all going to appear before God. In 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of God, that each one of us may receive the things done in the body, according to what he hath done, whether or good or bad. Now tell me one person is going to be left out. Who's not going to face God in judgment day? All of us. And anything we have done within this life is going to be brought up before us. We will know how we stand before God. Everything we've done, thought, and acted upon, He will know. Nothing is hidden from God. The fact in Psalms, the 89th chapter, verse 14, states the fact that righteousness and justice are the foundation of His throne. Mercy and truth goes before your face, as David wrote. We need to understand there is no more righteous judge than what Christ and God is. Everyone is going to give an account. Romans 14, chapter, verse 12. So then each one of us give an account of himself to God. You ready for that? <laughs> Think about it. You may be able to go down to the courthouse and fool them. They may not know everything about you. But before God, He's going to bring it all out. Everything. We can't hide anything. If you study 1 Corinthians, the 4th chapter, and verse 5, He even knows the motives of our hearts. That's tough. Think about it. Nobody might know what you're thinking. 
but God does. He knows the motives of your heart. He knows what you're thinking, what you're pre prepared to do. Also in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 13, brings up the fact that nothing is hidden from God. Nothing. Now think about it. Really. We need to be careful of what we say, how we think, how we act, because it's going to come to us at the day of judgment. And we're going to have to give account for the things we've done, said, and thought. Doesn't that scare you? Doesn't that make you think a little bit, what I have to do to be found righteous before God? And I can be prepared for the judgment day. Then judgment is pronounced. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 34 through 41, the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed. It's an everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. He will pass judgment on the things we have done throughout this lifetime. Have we done everything in accordance to God's will? Are we obedient and tried to hold fast to his word? Do we try to do everything the best we can, the best of our abilities, or are we just like those who, well, I, I know that individual sick or he's thrown in prison. He's not worth it. Really? What are you going to say to God on Judgment Day with that type of thinking? I know what he's going to tell you. Depart from me. I know you not. Judgment will be pronounced. There will be a great separation. Again in Matthew the 25th chapter verse 46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life. He will go away into everlasting punishment. But those who have done God's will up to this point, the best of their ability, will have eternal life. How we stand. We are going to be separated at the judgment day. One will go to the right and the other one to the left, as scriptures bring out. Have we really thought about it? This is something that is important. This is something that we're trying to emphasize this evening. That there are two appointments. We're going to die, and then there's going to be a judgment day. We need to be prepared for both. We need to do the right thing throughout our life. That we can receive heaven as our home. Or we can have hell to live in for eternity. It's hard to grasp eternity. Something that is everlasting. Something that has no beginning and no end. And I realize it's hard to explain it. It's hard to grasp it within your mind. It's scary when you sit back and really start thinking about it. 
and it should scare us to the point of trying to do what we can to keep from suffering forever. I used to use examples when I started out preaching back in the 70s. Take a thimble, go down to the Atlantic Ocean, and take one dip per hour and try to drain the Atlantic Ocean. And when you've done that, you got one second, millisecond of eternity. Now think about it. Taking a thimble, I don't know if they're used much nowadays, but <laughs> you used to take them and, and crochet and all that. So, take that thimble, go down there, it's not very big, take one dip an hour. And that's just the beginning of eternity. I can't imagine trying to do that and trying to drain it. There's our example that uh, if you tied a steel ball and you had a bird tied to it and, and it flew around that ball and the tip of its wing would hit that steel ball and by the time it wears it down to nothing, that's the beginning of the turn. I don't know any other way to explain it. And that's hard to grasp at that time. But there's something that should be putting a fear into us that we need to become obedient to God's will, that we are going to be separated and we are going to suffer the consequences. And we need to be prepared. Now I'm asking you, where are you going to? Are you ready for heaven? Can you truthfully stand back and say, I've done the best I could in holding to God's Word. I've done the best of my ability in trying to do what I can for God. Or, are you going to say, well, there's some things I just didn't like to do. So, I just didn't do it. And God, God will forgive me. Really? We can go to heaven. Revelation 21 and verse 4. God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Can you imagine? No more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, ever. For eternity. As we get older, we start getting aches and pains, and arthritis starts setting in. Every once in a while, I can't squeeze my hand because of arthritis. And you just feel like a sharp knife sometimes just stabbing the daylight's eyes. It brings tears to your eyes. It hurts. Painful. You ever suffer a burn? I think we all have. You get around a stove and cook a little bit. You're going to get burnt. <laughs> Hurts, don't it? No matter what you try to do for it, it, it lets you know it's there for a while. I've had second degree burns on my hands. I thank God that the doctor down here was able to save it without having to do skin graft. But you talk about pain. I had a wet washcloth. I mean, it poured water out of it. And by the time I got to Brook Hills to the top of this hill, it was as dry as you could get it. And this soaked all the moisture out of it. And thankfully, we caught him before he left the office where I've been trying to get to Wheeling or where, and I didn't know if I could have took it. You talk about gripping your teeth and gnashing it, biting your tongue, biting your lower lip, 
I'll let you know. It hurt. Can you imagine what hell is going to be like? And that's the other place. And as we read in Matthew 25th chapter, verse 41, Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, ye cursed into the everlasting fire that prepared for the devil and his angels. Which one do you rather have? Where would you rather go? Just realize death comes. We're all going to die. One point or another. Just be prepared. And one way to prepare is by doing God's will. That we can face the judgment day and be prepared for that judgment day and be able to give an answer to God how we stand. And He can say, Thou faithful servant, enter into the everlasting life. Wouldn't that be nice to hear? Wouldn't you be happy to hear that judgment day? But we got to prepare for that before death. Because we have no second chance. We have no second opportunity. I hope we realize that there is two appointments that we will be facing. Yes, we can cancel the appointments up on this earth. Going to the doctors, whatever. I guarantee you, there's no way you're going to cancel these two appointments. When God says it's time, it's time. And that's it. No end but. You're there. Are you ready? We're pleading with you this evening. Think about the condition you're in and where you're headed. Are you ready? Have you done God's will? Have you become a Christian? Hear His word, believe, repent, confess, be baptized by immersion, live a faithful life to death. We receive that to heaven as our home. There may be one here this evening that has done these things, but have fallen away, brought reproach upon themselves, upon the body of Christ. And if you don't straighten it out, you're heading for Matthew 25 and verse 41. You're in and up in hell. That's as plain and simple as you can be. Think about it. Do something about it. After we stand and sing the song, the invitation. <laughs>